Functions are one of the most exciting ideas you will encounter when learning how to program. They give you the ability to break down large problems into smaller ones and to reuse some of the complex solutions you developed in one place in other places in your programs. In this series of lessons, we're going to look at the intuition behind functions and where you've already encountered them and what purposes they serve. And in the subsequent videos, we'll look at, well, what is the actual syntax that you need to know in order to define your own functions and a little bit more detail on how our function call expressions formed. And last, we'll look at, well, what are the actual semantics? What's going on? How does the interpreter actually follow one of our function calls into a function definition and make sense of it? And what are the exact steps that are taken? But first, let's talk about what functions actually are and where we'll use them in our programs. We think of functions as building blocks for our code. We'll use them to add structure to our programs, but more commonly and more powerfully to create abstractions. Now, the word abstraction is one that's used throughout computer science, and it's in its own nature, pretty abstract. Um, we like to think of functions as process abstractions. What do I mean by this? Well, a process abstraction is one where uh, you can think in terms of sort of a bigger picture without having to know the exact details of how something is made and still make use of it. A common example is you go to a pizza shop and you look at the menu and you decide, you know what, I want a medium pizza that has three toppings and extra cheese on it. You are asking for someone to make you a pizza, right? But you don't know and you don't necessarily care the exact details for how the dough is made, how long it needs to be baked, how the ingredients were put on the pizza. All of those details of the process of making the pizza are abstracted away. And what you get to use as the customer is the ordering interface where you say, hey, I want a, a pizza and here are a few details about it that will customize the pizza that you're making for me. But I'm going to leave the details to the abstraction. And that's what process abstraction is. Another common example is when you're learning how to put on a t-shirt as a young kid and you're you know, getting which hole your arm goes in wrong or you're putting it in backwards or inside out. There are steps that go into learning how to do something. But once you've mastered something and once you've written a correct algorithm in our programs, you often think of it less about the details and you can sort of abstract those details away, consider them a solved problem and think more in terms of a higher level operation, such as putting on your t-shirt. The other benefit of having functions in our programs is that they give us the ability to subdivide or uh, break down the, uh, the, the, our larger programs into smaller ones. And we think of this uh, as task decomposition is our you know, formal term here. So task decomposition or problem decomposition. And this is a strategy that you use all the time. If you have a complex project that you're trying to take on, it can be overwhelming to think about the entirety of it all at once and how you might achieve something all in one go. So what do you do? Well, you break your problem down into smaller problems. You subdivide your problem, you divide and conquer. We will look at strategies for breaking larger programs into smaller subprograms, and functions will be a means for us to do that. We'll spend more time looking at task decomposition in future lessons. Uh, for this particular set of lessons, we're going to be focused more on the process abstraction side of it. So let's jump in and take a look at the two sides of uh, functions. We're going to have function calls and function definitions. And before we get into some of the, the nuance of this, I think it makes sense to try and jump into VS Code and demo uh, the difference. So I've pulled up VS Code and I'm just going to open up a Python REPL. All right, so I'm going to open up my terminal and uh, I've, I've made my terminal full screen here. And now let's just try starting a Python REPL. Okay, so I can program interactively and uh, we can call some functions. So the first function that you learn is the print function. So print is a function that you give it a string, uh, such as, you know, hello world. And what does print do? Well, it prints or it uh, sends some output to somewhere else. So this is a special kind of function called a procedure. We'll learn more about those later. But there are other kinds of functions we've used as well, such as the round function. So if I were to um, say my final score is a variable, 
that is maybe an integer. And uh, the final score is going to be my grade round it. So my grade might be 92.51, right? And so what is final score going to be? Well, this is a function call. This round, uh, let me highlight it here. Round is a function call. Oops, just one sec. All right, so round is a function call. We are saying there's, we don't know where round came from. We'll talk about that in just a moment, but round is a function and a function a call expression has a syntax. We use the name of the function followed by some parentheses and then the extra pieces of information that it needs, the arguments that we're giving it go in those parentheses. And here we're saying, hey, round the number 92.51, which is a float number. And whatever that evaluates to. So notice that, that that function call is going to need to evaluate some value. And in this case, we know that it must be an integer. It's then going to be assigned to final score. So if we were to print, well, what is final score? Let's give that a shot. So print final score. And we see that it's 93. So this was a, a function that rounded a number for us. We don't know the details, the exact algorithm that round used in order to achieve this. And the good news is we don't have to care. This is an example of process abstraction. We can go implement our own round function and we will uh, in a future lesson, but because it's been defined for us, once someone has solved this problem, we can make use of a solution through the, uh, the idea of process abstraction. We don't have to worry about the exact details of how this works once we know that it works generally. Uh, one other quick example that we can use is absolute value. So absolute value is, uh, say we have a number like X that's an integer, and let's say that it's you know, negative 110. Well, what is the absolute value of negative 110? Well, we can try using the absolute value function, which is abs in Python, and abs of X is 110, right? Absolute value is what is the distance of some point away from uh, zero on a number line. And negative 110 is 110 units uh, away. It just so happens to be in the, the negative uh, direction. So abs and round are functions. So is print. And there are many more, right? So here we're seeing function calls. We haven't yet seen a function definition. And we won't see one until the next lesson. But let's talk a little bit more about the difference between calls and definitions. So when we call a function, what we're, what we're doing is we're invoking its definition or we're, we're making use of it, right? And so when we make use of a function, it's kind of like the example of ordering a pizza at the counter. You say, hey, I wanna order a specific item off this menu. That's gonna be the name of our function. And here are the different uh, parameters I want you to use. Those, those are my arguments, the number of toppings, things like that. Uh, and you're gonna wait for your pizza and eventually after that pizza process is, is completed, you'll, it'll come back to you and be served to you or returned back to you. Okay, so uh, let's talk about first calls. Function calls are expressions. And this has significant meaning, which hopefully you're starting to appreciate that, that it, some, if something's an expression, that gives it some, uh, there's an important set of features that, that follow that understanding, right? We, we know that it's going to be something that evaluates when the program reaches that point and it's going to evaluate down to some value. So even though we have a call written in our code, um, when we said abs of negative 110, that evaluated to a value of 110. Expressions have types. So that means that a function call has a type that's associated with it, right? Our expressions that result in a specific type, and I I'm gonna use the word return, but uh, uh, we can say in quotes, result, because it's a very similar concept, result in a specific type. And we'll look at the details of function calls expressions soon. We know that there's also arguments that we have to give a function call expression if that function expects them, all right? When we call a function, we're making use of its definition. So that's the other side of, of the function coin. Somewhere, somebody has to have defined a function before we can call it and use it. All right. Um, before we talk about definition, I, I want to make one more note here that calls you will often see, you will often hear referred to as uh, invocations. Oops, referred to uh, using a function, 
we're invoking a function. And I, the, the word invoking is kind of fun because, you know, it kind of gives you the sense that, that there's some spell that's being invoked in your program. And it's actually not too far from that, right? When you, when you have a spell book, you think of that as your function definitions that tells you here are the steps that you need to take to invoke some spell. But separately, you, you know, when you're flipping through your book and you say, oh, here's, here's the, the spell I want to invoke and, and you actually carry out those steps, right? So the definition is the other side of this. So definitions are subprograms that define what actually happens uh, specifying what happens when a function is called. This is the recipe. Right? And so this is just like when you order a pizza, behind the scenes, the chef is going to be carrying out and following the instructions of the recipe or of the definition. Right? Now, we haven't seen definitions, but we have seen calls. So where do these definitions come from? Primarily, you're going to see them in three places. Right? So the first place that we'll see function definitions are built-ins. And we've talked a little bit about built-ins. Built-ins are special functions that in Python are available to you by default in every Python program. They're in the global uh, scope, so you can use them without having to import them or having to define them yourself. These are functions that are just so commonly used in programs like absolute value or rounding numbers or printing things out uh, that, they, that, that, that the Python programming language decided, hey, I want to uh, make this a first class top level built in function that's just immediately always available to you. Uh, and, and that's great. So we've got those. Uh, we're going to see there are some functions that are defined in libraries. Uh, we'll find some definitions are imported from libraries and we'll take a look at this in just a second. So the idea is, you know, libraries are going to provide your spell book or your recipe book. And if you want to use some particular function from one of your libraries, you're going to need to import it. And that means we're going to bring its definition and its name into our program so that when we refer to it, Python knows what we're talking about. Right. We'll look at an example of that in just a moment. Uh, the last place where we'll see function definitions occur is when we define them ourselves. So, uh, uh, so uh, defined in the same module. And a module is just a Python file. Right. We'll look at Python uh, modules and packages in more detail soon. So the idea is uh, function definitions can come from three places, right? One from built-ins, two imported from uh, libraries. In both of those cases, we're not rewriting those function definitions. You won't see them in your code. We're just pulling them in from somewhere else. Uh, and someone else wrote them. Three, uh, when we define a function in our programs, which we'll look at in the very next lesson, we are able to use that function definition after the Python interpreter has encountered it and, and sort of uh, stored it into its, its working memory so that it knows what we mean when we refer to the name of, of a function that we define. All right. So let's take a look at importing uh, a, a function from a library. And I'm once again going to go back to my VS Code example. And uh, we're going uh, to import uh, the random integer function from the random library. So random is a standard library in Python. It comes with every Python distribution. And it has some functions defined in it, one of which is uh, named randint. So we're going to import the randint function. And now we can use that function definition. So what does randint do? Well, it, it allows us to give it two pieces of information. We can give randint two arguments. And we can use it to generate a random number between and including those arguments. So let's imagine we're trying to roll a dice. So uh, if I have an integer that is rolled dice and I assign to it the result of evaluating a function call to rand int with say one and six as the bounds of my, uh, my function call or my randomization, well, if we now go see, well, what is the result of uh, that was stored in rolled dice? And I should have named that variable die instead of dice, but it was a six that time. Uh, if I were to uh, just print the result of rand int one through six, 
we see that the second time we call this five was given back and your results, if you're following along, aren't going to be the same as mine because we have randomization here. If I press the up keyword and press enter, notice I get a different number back each time we evaluate this. And this is, there's an abstraction here, a process abstraction. Rand int has some algorithm that we don't know about. We don't know how it works, but somehow it's giving us back a random number between one and six inclusive. Now, if you're used to the mathematical uh, definition of a function or a relation, as you'll commonly see it in, in discrete math, um, you'll know that a function in math should, you know, you have one input or one set of inputs and you expect a single output. Notice here that we've got the same inputs and we're, we're getting a different output each time. So you have to be very careful to recognize that when you go between domains, when you go between programming and mathematics, oops, uh, you are going to encounter words that are related to one another, such as the idea of a function, uh, that are going to be different in their actual semantics between these two contexts. So a function in computer science and in programming specifically is different than you think of when you think about the constraints of a function in math or algebra. And so these two concepts aren't exactly equal to one another, although they are closely related, right? And you can, uh, we can define mathematical functions in uh, computer science and programming terms, um, but there are some functions that, that we'll write that aren't really the exact, it wouldn't be considered functions or, or pure true functions in the mathematical sense. Um, so there are some distinctions here. Uh, a lot of your knowledge will transfer between these two subjects, but they're not precisely the same. All right, so this was a very quick and intuitive introduction to some of the key concepts of what functions are. We use them to structure our programs, break up our problems into subtasks. We also use them as we're seeing uh, to take some small algorithms or even some big algorithms and try and abstract the details of those algorithms away so that when we use a function, we don't have to worry about all of the details of exactly how it works under the hood as long as we know that that function was implemented correctly. In the next lesson, we're going to take a look at, well, what is the syntax we need to know in order to define our own functions? And this is a really exciting capability to have because it means we'll be able to invent our own functions and use those as building blocks in our own programs.